Right, welcome everybody to um, support Ukraine's panel discussion. It's uh, at an important time, pre-election. Before I give the introductions, I'm going to pass the mic over to a big friend of the Ukrainian community in London, Steve Lacey, and he's going to talk about a few projects that he's got going at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> So, a couple of months ago, I was here at the last event, and we, we've been making a film myself and Daniel, who's a film director here, following the stories of three uh, Ukrainians in remote islands over the course of the year and a half. We did a call out to get the last bit of funding to make it. We've got £13,000, which means that Daniel can now do the last bit of filming in Ireland, but most importantly, we can hire a Ukrainian who's displaced to do the editing and make the film a reality. The second announcement, and really I want to talk about the four apocalypses that Russia has unleashed on Ukraine, which is genocide, ecocide, lingocide, and culturecide. And I want to talk about two of them. So we've been really pushing on ecocide, and we want need to keep that pressure going for what they did to kick off the ban. We managed to get a, a very reputable uh, advertising agency called St. Luke's who have given their time to do a big campaign around the coffee ban which had an impact. But most importantly I want to talk about cultural side. So Russia has brought back the, what's called the Executed Renaissance which happened in the 1930s where the brightest sparks of Ukraine, the designers, the artists, the writers have all been uh, getting killed on mass scale and we moan in the West about cancel culture. That, this is not my words, this is the words of Victoria Amelina. And on Monday's anniversary of her death, she was a writer, she was, she was a children's writer, and in the last year of her life, she documented the awful war crimes that Russia had, had unleashed. I think it's really, really important that we constantly keep the memories alive, not just for Victoria, but everyone who's defending the freedoms of the world, those freedoms of dignity, Freedom and liberty. Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Steve. Uh, before I start introducing tonight's event, I want to say a big thank you to Vlodko Pavluk and the Associ Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, London branch, for hosting tonight's event. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Today's event has also been made possible because of Support Ukraine. Thank you to everyone who attended the previous event in discussion with John Sweeney. We managed to raise a grand total of £1,675 and one pence. <laughs> and all the proceeds went directly to medics on the front line. So that was a really well done. So a round of applause again. Similarly, for today's event, all money raised will be sent to the, the frontline medics. And uh, that, that's a really important thing, you know, that they can do that job. It's, it's a dangerous job anyway, but to try and make it safer for them to do, because they're doing a great job. And so on to tonight's event. The UK general election is important not only for Britain and Britons, but also a pivotal moment for the relationship between Britain and Ukraine. To abandon Ukraine, or to fail to increase military support for Ukraine, would be to, be, it would be to abandon a people fighting for freedom from totalitarian tyranny and a departure from British interests. Supporting Ukraine is not only a matter of aiding a nation in need, but also a critical component of maintaining the UK's role and reputation as a global leader in the defence of freedom, rights, decency and democracy. It is therefore reassuring that the majority of manifestos, with the exception of reform, mention supporting Ukraine. The Conservatives talk about guaranteeing Ukraine the support it needs for the long haul, assuring uh, current levels of support for as long as they are required, 
the Labour Party promises with Labour the UK's military, financial, diplomatic and political support for Ukraine will remain steadfast. The Liberal Democrats say they will stand with the people of Ukraine and provide them with the support they need in the face of Putin's illegal invasion. And the Greens talk about continuing to support Ukraine as it resists Russian invasion. And also uh, a small mention for Plaid Cymru and the SNP. Both will continue to support Ukraine's right to defend itself. And that brings me on to the title of tonight's event. The motto has to be not Ukraine can win, but Ukraine will and must win. And why? Because all other alternatives perpetuate this nightmare for Ukrainians and will mean no end to Russia's belligerence. Introducing the distinguished panel tonight, uh, Ed Lucas is a writer, journalist, security specialist, and Liberal Democrats standing in the cities of London and Westminster. Round of applause. <laughs> Paul Mason is a writer and broadcaster on economic and social justice and a member of the Labour Party. Round of applause. Last but not least, Mesa Gifford is a former currency trader, volunteer fighter, and medic in the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Round of applause. <laughs> Mesa has previously been a Conservative Party councillor. And then finally, tonight's moderator, the host of the Silicon Curtain podcast, creator of one of the most influential pro-Ukraine channels with guests such as Mark Galliotti and Ben Hodges, to name a few, it's Jonathan Fink. <laughs> and without further ado, it's over to Jonathan. Thank you very much. And I should say our three wonderful panellists have all been on the channel as well, so please do check those out afterwards. And a couple of words for people who are going to be watching this online. It will be a couple of days after the event, but hopefully you will experience some of the atmosphere here and get to hear some of the questions the audience ask as well. Please do make sure that if you're not subscribed, definitely do that. Subscribe, like, add a comment, join in the debate. Please also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description video. It's incredibly important to help Ukraine remain resilient at this time. Well, let's turn to the election. I'm going to put the questions and I'm going to give each of our audience a chance to ask the same question. But at the end of the format, we are going to have a chance for the audience to put some questions to our fantastic panel. Now, we've heard about all the parties' mandates there on Ukraine, and they're all you know, the tone is right, the words are right, but really how prominent is foreign policy and the Ukraine issue in this election? Is it really going to swing the result in any meaningful sense? Uh, let's, let's start with Edward. Hello, everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be back here after, what was it, a week or something since the last hustings. Um, the good news is that we have a consensus between the parties on... Ukraine, and it's a positive one, and therefore there's no huge argument. Uh, you have to go to George Galloway and his party, or Nigel Farage and his party, to the extremes of the spectrum to have um, an argument in job, or that, that, that may be. The bad news is that the consensus is actually inadequate. We haven't done nearly enough. There's far too much backslap far too much congratulation, far too much empty rhetoric, and the price of our failure is paid in the short term by the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who've been maimed or traumatized or displaced or have lost their lives. It's also paid by us because our failure to support Ukraine has turbocharged Putin's aggression. It's raised the spectre of nuclear blackmail actually working. And it's made all of us here in Britain 
a lot less safe too. So I feel that I am screaming as loud as I can, but somehow nobody's listening. I've been warning about this since the 1990s, about the danger of Russian imperialism. And every time I think that opinion makers and decision makers, opinion formers and decision makers have woken up, they seem to go back to sleep again. And the debate we had here a few days ago with Felicity Buckham saying, Britain's been in the forefront. We've been, in, she kept saying, incredible. We've been incredibly good. Incredible actually means unbelievable. And I feel that we are not credible. We have done nothing in the West to make Russia think, ouch, that hurt. We better not do that again. And as I say, the price has been paid by Ukrainians. So I'm angry and ashamed about how little we've done in the West, and I wish we could stop praising ourselves for the little we have done, because it wasn't nearly enough. I have to say I uh, agree with Ed. Um, there is one good thing about uh, the mainstream parties at the moment is there is broad consensus on, uh, on Ukraine. Um, I would say, though, that, um, well, let's, let's disagree early doors. Um, we shouldn't, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Ed. Um, the West uh, generally has not done enough for Ukraine. That's certainly true. Um, one thing that Britain has done is it has um, often got the, uh, the, the, the conversation started. They've often got the aid where it's needed to be uh, purely by leading by example on things like tanks, uh, on the long-range missiles, that sort of thing. Um, we can definitely do more. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I'm, I do think, uh, if we're going to talk about uh, the Conservative Party and how they um, have helped Ukraine, I do think that Boris Johnson saw Ukraine as a way to show Europe and the world, and Brexit voters generally, that Britain uh, could have an independent and strong foreign policy after, the, after leaving the EU. Um, so, which in some ways they have. Um, and yeah, I, I do think though that um, hopefully the Conservative Party, or actually the next government, the Labour Party, will continue to build on what the Conservatives have started and very much uh, keep supporting Ukraine, basically. So, um, thank you, Mason. And I just want to say you know, how privileged I feel to be sitting next to you as someone who's put you know, their, their life on the line for the victory of Ukraine. The Labour Party, which I'm an activist in, I have a kind of share of voice because I'm a journalist and slightly influential within it. I speak to, to members of the Shadow Cabinet. Um, stands 100% behind Ukraine. Um, it is an existential issue. Um, I think everyone in a decision-making role understands how important it is for Ukraine to win. But I think up till now, that's been very much expressed in a moral and principled way. That is, they understand that our security as a country, UK, depends on the existence of a rules-based order. Mm -hmm. And the invasion of Ukraine was the attempt to smash the rules-based order. So if it succeeds, our own national security is, is threatened. And we also are a country that stands for, and we are as a party, has always, even, to be honest, when it was at its worst, when it was invading Iraq, tried to do so under international law. They tried to observe international law, justice, and, and uh, international human rights. Now, I think my party, which I believe will win the election next week, I don't know by how much, but they will be forming a government, has to now start thinking about the self-interest of the UK. It's thought of this very much as principle, but there's a self-interest. You're, see, you're going to see a government whose ministers are going to be told one thing from the moment they enter their ministries on, on Friday morning. Growth is the key. Economic growth is our number one priority. Anyone who thinks economic growth is going to happen in a world where Russia has seized 27% of the grain uh, supply, it currently has 17, Ukraine has 10. 27% of the grain supply, much of the oil and gas, Huge amounts of critical minerals, which are crucial to the, tran the green tran transition. It's not going to happen. Labour's project in government depends, in many ways, I would say, on Ukraine surviving and winning. And I think we get that. Our, our, our leaders get that. 
Do our voters get it? Do the British people get it? I'm not sure. Um, I don't think so. They're disengaged partly because we've all been so, uh, we've had the propensity to agree. And we've assumed that the, a lot of the heavy lifting on Ukraine will be done by America. Now, here's the problem. First problem, France, likely to have probably a minority right-wing government, far-right government, which is wavering on Ukraine. If Trump wins, we're in a, a world of pain. If Trump wins, then just to fulfill the defense of NATO, let alone Ukraine, we're going to be talking about huge hikes in European defense spending, which again will knock everybody's plans off course. So the Trump problem, the problem of, of, of France, need, means to me that the, the party I'm part of needs to be far more proactive than many of its members or its local councillors or some of these new MPs who might win to their surprise, you know, there's a landslide, far more proactive than anybody, anybody suspects. And what does pro proactivity mean? I pay tribute to what Boris Johnson did. Not only that, to what Ben Wallace, the former Defence Secretary, did when he sent HMS Defender through uh, the Black Sea in, in June, June, it's almost the anniversary, June 2021, to send a signal to Putin. It, it, I always joke, HMS Defender was, was, was fully armed with, with journalists at the time, <laughs> because it was. It had a BBC and a Sky crew on it, uh, and key, uh, key, key other journalists, because the aim was to show what happened. And the British deny this, but the Russians assert, assert that they fired a shot across the bows of HMS Defender. I am glad that we did that. I'm glad that we sent the end laws at the time we did. I'm glad that we have these task forces inside the MOD who are trying to uh, focus British ingenuity into Ukraine's war effort. We're going to need to do a lot more. And what's going to be the greatest asset we can build in doing that is first, proactive support by British people. Which, you know, I, I have a lot of connections with Wales. through. I work through a Ukrainian solidarity campaign and my, my colleagues have to them in, uh, who's a, a Welsh MS, has been exemplary in trying to push uh, aid through. But it's, it's, about, it's about more than that now. It's about actually winning the argument with the British people that we need to be standing with Ukraine, not for as long as it takes, but for whatever it takes. And I hope in the, in this evening we might be able to discuss what that is. Because these are glib phrases, but they are concrete, and you know all too well, Mesa, Concrete, uh, concrete requirements that we as a society need to be fulfilling for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. So for the next question I was going to ask whether we should line around, uh, align around Ukrainian victory, and it sounds like we are, and the right kind of noises are being made, but I'm going to pick up what Paul said there, because before we help Ukraine, we also need to make sure that we can defend ourselves. And this afternoon I was speaking to Sir Richard Sheriff, a, a former uh, Deputy Commander of NATO Forces Europe, and he made the point that we've, we have to make up for decades and decades, where all parties have underspent on the military. The Army, uh, the Navy are dramatically under-resourced for what the requirement is, and we're struggling to get firm commitments even to meet the 2.5% of GDP. Um, it's the specifics of how we can help Ukraine, which I think we need to focus on. We're all aligned broadly on what we need, uh, what's required in terms of victory, but, but how are we going to get these firm commitments out of a new government? Edward, please, go first. Um, so I'm going to stand up, just so I'd like to be able to see um, the distinguished members of the audience at the back. Um, our defences are shambles. It's absolute disgrace and nobody's talking about it. We are committed to supplying NATO with one warfighting division with immediate readiness and another one to be ready within a short time frame. We can't do it. We have fundamentally broken our promises to NATO in terms of the army. We have ships that can't go to sea because they're broken. We have the two useless air carriers. Um, we have the aircraft carriers. Um, we have planes without pilots. We have an enormous manpower shortage. Um, the most able people leaving the army because life there is so grim and boring, 
disgraceful military accommodation. And uh, we don't have enough ammunition to have exercises anymore. Our deployment on the continent is mainly in Estonia, and they have, a, I, mean, I guess, the exact number of days is secret. But they've got a, enough ammunition for about one or two weeks. And it's not surprising that not only do our enemies not take us seriously, but our allies don't take us seriously. Um, the Americans have said bluntly they no longer regard us as a first-tier military power. Now that's partly the result of political decision-making over the past 20, 30 years, where the emphasis was on light expeditionary warfare, and the whole idea of having tanks was seen as um, and doing sort of conventional defence against Russia was a career killer, if that's what you're interested in. The last big armoured exercise. I don't know if anyone in the audience knows this. When did the um, British Army last do a brigade level armoured exercise? So guess. Come on, hands up. Take a point. 91. No, not quite as bad as that, 2001. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's pretty shocking. So that even the people who remember how to do this as junior officers are now probably at the end of their careers. And you're absolutely right. The, if, we, if Ukraine is forced into some kind of truce or armistice and Putin walks away from this with some sort of ter territorial gains, that will show that nuclear blackmail works and we're going to need to spend a lot more on defence. And if Trump comes in, and actually I would argue even if the, with the Democrats, even with Biden, we've had a fundamental jolt to our confidence in America. The dithering, the delays, this, all this Jake Sullivan stuff about dead bits escalate, um, the focus on the Indo-Pacific. We no longer trust America the way we used to. And if you look at the numbers and talk to the military clans, if the Americans pull out, as Trump has been threatening, how long would it take you in the absolutely best possible case, assuming unlimited money, total political will, no Le Pen, no you know, Maloney, no this, no Schultz, no this, no that. In an absolutely ideal world, it would take us 10 years. And how long would Russia be, will be, be how long would it take Russia to reboot? Two or three. And that's the gap. That's what we're facing. And that's going to be far we won't be talking about whether we can get to 2.5%. We're going to need to go back to Cold War levels, 5% plus and more. And nobody in our two main political parties, or indeed for that matter in mine, if anyone's listening, is talking about the immediate danger we face on that. Yeah, if I, um, if I were to sit here and try and defend the Conservative Party's defence policy over the last few years, I would be in danger of looking pretty foolish. Um, but uh, then again, it's actually a problem, I think, that not just our country has, but across Europe. Um, I, I think only the Americans have invested uh, the right amount of money in their own armed forces to maintain uh, a very strong, incredible force. Um, all the political parties in Britain are pretty anemic on detail when it comes to what they intend to do for the armed forces. Um, that includes how they might grow, um, how they might properly be able to equip themselves, particularly as uh, since the end of the Cold War, the so-called peace dividends that, um, that it produced, um, we have just run down our stocks. We just have not invested in the military enough to be, uh, as Ed says, uh, a credible uh, force against our enemies. Um, I think we've also been focused far too much, and I think the... the attention of Britain and many people in the West has been on um, low-level insurgency warfare, particularly in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and we've sort of lost sight of proper peer-to-peer -peer, um, sort of combat and what that nece uh, what, how, what, what's necessary to s sustain that. Um, I, I just hope that the British government, the next British government, uh, I do hope Labour has sort of said that they will uh, hit the 2.5% if uh, economic conditions allow, and I hope you can expand on that. I ho really hope they do, um, and hopefully that will translate into more equipment for Ukraine. If we can start building more weapons in the United Kingdom, if we can start arming, uh, then there may be further scope in the future for providing more weapons to Ukraine. I'm glad that um, uh, the long-range missiles um, 
I forget it's called, it's not Scalp, is Storm it? Shadow. Storm Shadow, that's the one, uh, has restarted production. Um, we need plenty more of that. Uh, and as we build them, we should be shipping them straight to Ukraine, because Ukraine very much is on the front line at the moment. Thank you, Mesa. And so, all of this is kind of public knowledge, but I wanted to slightly decode it if I can, because I, I kind of know how Labour is thinking. We'll come to power with not much money. You can't borrow, and the tax take is high. So, in the 30s, when Britain rearmed, it rearmed through borrowing on a defence specific loan. But it's, it wasn't well known to my grandparents' generation, because it was secret. Uh, that the first attempt to raise that loan failed. Bank of England had to provide the money. I, it's, even then, you know, with the fascism imminent, it wasn't easy to rearm by borrowing. And that's why that, you're not even seeing that debate. Nobody's, it, what, what the politicians among us can do here tonight and in this post-election period is to bring the, the debate of if we need maybe 5% of GDP to be sent on defence, Where's it going to come from? That's, I will fully admit that's not quite there yet in, in any party, including mine. What is there is our critique of what happened under Boris Johnson. I mean, it's great that Johnson was proactive on Ukraine. The problem was he set off on something called Global Britain, which was the, the idea was something called the Indo-Pacific Tilt. We'll go and be an independent player in the Pacific with our aircraft carriers um, and the rest of it. And Johnson made a mistake you know, he's well known for, for humming on the road to Mandalay when he was in Burma. Bad idea. It's an imperialist poem. But also, when he made the speech, he was in Greenwich and he pointed to the ceiling and he pointed to Clive of India, who's painted on the ceiling. He said, there it is. That's what we're going to do again. We're going to go into the world. And look, it didn't work out that way because we've played no in independent role in international affairs. Russia is a threat. The, the, the theatre of operations is going to be NATO and the High North and, and Ukraine and the Black Sea. And by setting off on the wrong track, he set the kind of British security establishment off on the wrong track. No, they self-corrected. In 2023, one year into the war, they, they put a, a new assessment saying, right, the threat is Europe. Okay, we're going to, the threat is clearly Russia. There's clearly a threat of escalation. But what did they do? They didn't raise spending. And what then happened, and Ed, Ed uh, has, has um, referred to it, there is a long-standing debate within the British Armed Forces between land and maritime. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, some of you know about it, clearly. Um, I don't want to get sidetracked into that, because what I want to do, and what I think Labour will do, it said it will carry out a strategic defence review. Note the words for the dweebs among you who know about this, it's not a strategic security and defence review, it's a strategic defence review. And that means it will focus on the threat. When we can calibrate the threat, if the people who do this, now they won't be politicians, they'll be civil servants and military, and hopefully think tankers and you, civil society, will have your say. And if the assessment comes back, shit. You know, Russia's threat is so great to us that we need to be spending 3.5, 4.5, that's where the argument begins, because that's where it gets serious. Um, I wanted that, that security and defense review to be rigorous and objective, because to be honest, I don't want to be spending money on aircraft carriers if it can be spent on hospitals or tanks. If the Poles are buying a thousand tanks from South Korea, we might, we've only got 148, having another hundred might not be the most important thing. It's good for national prestige. I want it to be done rigorously. So you do the SDR first, and then you do, and I think you'll find that's the early debate in the next government, and we should all be part of it. And when, it, when it's concluded, that's where you then say, full strength behind the decision. I think that's where I would like to see Labour building a national consensus around whatever the decision is, and we rebuild our armed forces in the shape that is most appropriate to, to what's in front of us. Just, I don't know, I'll just finish by saying, and, and if, unfortunately, if Trump wins and walks away from Europe, the shape that's appropriate for Britain might not be what we think it is now.
I'm going to go off script here a little bit because what you've just said prompts, I think, a really interesting point, and it's one which hopefully Mesa can can talk to you. So I'm going to get him to, to address this one first. Spending is something that people are very nervous around, and huge sums involved. What is happening in Ukraine is an extraordinary, rapid, and agile evolution of military technology, and. What they're doing exceptionally well is the entrepreneurs in the Ukrainian equivalent of Silicon Valley are talking to their cousins and their friends on the front and they're sending back data in real time, iterating their tech and scaling up the training. It's happening at an extraordinary pace, which I would argue our administrations, our procurement processes are really not geared up and our military probably is not geared up to do that as well. So you've experienced this. You, you left the front line for a couple of months, and when you came back, everything had, had changed. If you can sort of address that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go and try and address how we can address that as a, as a political body and a military. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, basically, over the summer, uh, I've been, um, I took a break from the front line. I'd been fighting um, all through the autumn, uh, the winter of uh, 2022, January, February, up until March. Of 2023, um, and then when my father became unwell, I went back to the United Kingdom just to rest for about a month or so. And up until that point, I was based in Herson. I was operating on the islands, and um, it, this is working, right? Yeah. Okay, good to check. Um, we were operating on the islands, uh, doing uh, waterborne operations, uh, basically taking the islands back. And the significance of that was very much that by holding the islands, we had forewarning of any attack on Hassan. Um, we're also, of course, liberating Ukrainian territory, which was, uh, is a goal in and itself. Uh, and also, um, we were taking the fight to the Russians, because I have to say, in Hassan, we were very much had, the, uh, had both an advantage and we were pushing all through those early months. In fact, uh, I often called it the secret river war. Everyone was talking about what was going on in Bakhmut in the north, and there was, a, there was a few people worried about the progress of the war. But in the south, we were actually taking quite vast amounts of, of territory and killing a high number of uh, Russian troops. And we went from this environment whereby uh, we were dictating the terms of the combat and, and where it was fought and taking back land. I went back for a single month and by the time, time I got back, uh, the situation had completely changed. The Russians had brought in a huge amount of drones, both uh, FPV drones and uh, drones that could drop ordnance on our heads. And it was so bad that um, every time we got on a boat, we were hit, essentially. And uh, yeah, a number of our guys were injured. Uh, no, no one fatally, thankfully. Um, and not only that, when we were finally got to the islands, the Russian tactic of annihilating every single dwelling on the island just made it incredibly difficult to exist there uh, because they, there was constant drones. And it's, there's something quite sinister. You can just almost imagine it because it's, it's happened to me a fair few times. There's something uh, movie-esque quality to uh, a sinister quality to hiding in a building at one o'clock in the morning and you can hear a drone going zzzz, and it's looking through the windows of the building that you're hiding in. I've often found myself in the corner of a room uh, pushed up against the wall as a drone is trying to look inside the windows. Um, and it just shows you that as recently as 10 years ago, that just wasn't the case. Um, I, I suppose when I was in Syria, uh, the Islamic State did a lot to uh, advance drone-dropped uh, technology using civilian quadcopters. Um, they used it not to great effect. It, it mostly it harassed the, the, the Kurdish fighters as they took back places like Raqqa. Um, but uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians as well have absolutely fundamentally changed drone warfare for good. Um, there will be ways to combat that. Um, when I, as soon as I got back and we were facing this drone threat, I actually copied the Russians. We actually set up our own drone team for the 131st. Um, and uh, we primarily used uh, FPVs, directly targeting the Russians on the other side of the bank. And actually the situation has now reversed since then, whereby now the Ukrainians very much have more drones than the Russians. Um, but one thing that we started to encounter, just as we adapted to the Russians, the Russians then adapted to us, because they began to bring out a very sophisticated electro uh, electronic warfare, whereby uh, often we would send up two or three drones to hit a target, and they would just fall out of the sky. And I remember the day that they, they almost turned it on, because I was on a mission, and there was a tank right in the open, and my guys went, quick, hit it. And they, put, they sent a drone, and it went, bloop, flopped out of the sky. They said, quick, hit it again, and bloop, 
it fell out of the sky. Third time, hit it again, because they were so desperate to hit it that we lost like three or four drones and it drove off. Um, and then we realized we can't, that's, we just wasted about two and a half grand there. Um, and the realities of warfare suddenly hit us in the face and we had to adapt. Well, let's, let's uh, turn to Paul next. I mean, this is happening incredibly rapidly. We're talking about days and weeks in terms of the turnaround time. Are we geared up both for our you know, technological procurement, uh, bringing down the unit cost, and the, the learnings of this? I'm guessing we're not. Well, um, I don't know whether this is working again. It's, I think this one might. This one might. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the only answer is I wouldn't know because um, and I don't want to know. Um, I, don't, I don't think that needs to be under democratic, that issue needs to be under democratic control. It needs, as, as long as some politicians somewhere are un, in control of an MOD and a British industrial response to that, and hopefully that happens at the level of Ramstein and other you know, bilateral activities within uh, the, the, the Western Alliance. Um, the obvious thing, and this is a horrible thing to say to, to, to someone who's been a combatant, the obvious, from the point of view of the, the back, you know, I've studied quite, I mean, I've spent a lot of time since this war started literally reading the minutes of cabinet meetings in the Second World War, literally reading um, minutes of how the British industrial um, machine was geared up. The, when you think of how would they have done it, they simply look at that problem and they go, well, you've got two things that we need to apply to that. Mass, so mass production, instead of, 10 drones, you, you, you needed to, you, you could have, with 30 drones maybe the ECM wouldn't have worked on top number 29. And the other thing is autonomy. You, if you, you show that problem to, to anybody in Silicon Valley, they go, well, what you need is, is drones that kill people without being talked to. And unfortunately, this, this is the scary thing, we, as soon as I say that, quite rightly, if I say it to a British politician, they go, oh, well, have we got, have we, haven't we got some regulations about this? Well, actually, in the United Kingdom, we've got regulations that you can't fly a drone uh, full stop without CAA approval. But, yes, we do have regulations about autonomy and, and, and killing machines. Unfortunately, our adversaries, which don't just include Russia, it will include China, North Korea, and Iran, they are working right now on autonomous drone swarms that will kill people en masse. So I'm afraid that's the, the escalation path is going to be in that direction. All I want from our, from our government and from our industry is to engage and to do it uh, ethically but right. And, and in the end of the day, like I say, I think it's a military technical task that is, like a lot of things in this war, best left to the experts. Now, I, Paul has made one of the points that I wanted to make, but I want to amplify it a bit. The centre of gravity in Europe has shifted dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years. It used to be that everything that was important happened in the so-called Old West. That's where the best informed people were, that's where the most important decisions were made, that's where all the money was, that's where stuff happened. And what the Ukraine war and the expansion of NATO and the EU has done has been to shift that. So we now have the most military important countries in Europe are Poland, which has now got more tanks, more advanced tanks, more howitzers, more ammunition, to some extent more everything um, than the British Army. And in terms of innovation, it's definitely Ukraine with mm. help from Estonians and others. And they're streets ahead. We are still trying to develop our British military drone program, which is exquisitely engineered. I think, are they 10 million each or something like that? I, I mean, they're, and they st we still haven't got them working because, you know, licenses and health and safety and blah, blah, blah. So we are in the era of the red flag, a man with a red flag walking in front of a car. And the um, Ukrainians are in the era of the, of the supercar. And we've got, we haven't quite woken up to that yet. We need to learn, and we need to listen, and we need some humility in this country. And I've been really struck over the last few years to see this shift in Whitehall and in the MOD and the intelligence services and other bits of government. That whereas 15, 20 years ago we used to patronise the East Europeans, we used to, used to send people out to teach them how to deal with disinformation. 
Literally, <laughs> literally, we would send people to Estonia to try and teach Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians how to deal with Russian disinformation. <laughs> and, and, and they were incredibly polite, but saying, you know, thank you very much. And then usually the trainers we'd send would come back and say, actually, I learned quite a lot from that. So it was completely pointless. But we are, we are only in the beginning of realising how far the nature of warfare has changed and also how much we have to learn and how old-fashioned a lot of our thinking is. Um, just getting back to the previous point about how the, the future of British defence is to plug the gaps. It's not to be a full spectrum military power. We can't afford it. We don't need the aircraft carriers. We probably don't need tanks. We should focus on doing the things that only we can do and the things that we do best and plug the gaps. And of course, the question then is, do you trust the people between the gaps? And I think that's the huge question going forward, is how do we redo European defence? Are we going to have a European pillar of NATO? Is it going to be EU-based? But somehow this enormous lump of political and economic power between here and Kiev, or actually between Dublin and Kiev, because the Irish are actually quite important here, um, and from Norway through to Turkey, somehow we've got to find a way of getting together, making decisions, pooling costs, sharing risks, and I think that is really going to be the huge task mm. for the next government, is working out how Britain fits into that. Well, Edwards very kindly provided the cue to the next question, because, of course, Russian aggression... Can read? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, turn the notes over. Um, Russian aggression, of course, is, is multi-level. It's not just military aggression. That, that of course, gets a lot of the attention... Uh, but it's in the information sphere as well. They are injecting their narratives into our political system. The question following this will touch on some of the individuals who are doing that. But the first answer, the, the first answer I'm seeking here is, how do we gear up to become more resilient on the information sphere? How do we push back against grey zone warfare, the sabotage, the assassinations, which aren't theoretical, they're happening right now across Europe? Uh, let's let's go the traditional order, starting with Edward. Yeah. Well, I've got a two-page piece on this on the Saturday after the election for people who are fed up with election coverage. So by the time it's on Saturday week, and it's really serious. We are facing a kind of new generation. I, I, first of all, please don't look at information operations in isolation. Almost always, information operations are part of other influence operations. You may have some influence operations that happen in secret, but on the whole, we make a huge mistake if we think we can deal with Russia just by looking at Russian media and propaganda and so on. There's always going to be other elements to it as well. But we face an epidemic of this stuff. We've just seen the factory being attacked in Germany. We've got the cyber attack here in London, which has crippled a chunk of the NHS. We have one of Navalny's top aides beaten with a hammer in Vilnius. Uh, we've had the IKEA in Vilnius, someone tried to burn that down. It just goes on and on and on. And the new generation of these attacks, which is very difficult to deal with, is based on hiring criminals and hooligans. So the people who yeah. burnt down, the, uh, who, who, who attacked the IKEA, and the, the people who attacked Volkov in Lithuania, and I know this, so I just had a briefing from Lithuanians, they were Polish football hooligans. They were paid 3,000 3, euros to go, they were shown a photo of Volkov, told where he lives, go and beat this guy with a hammer, don't kill him. And if you do it, you get more money, if you go to jail, you get a bit more money. And for people who spend their lives in and out of the criminal justice system, being sent to jail for three or five years is no great deterrent, whereas 5,000 euros is really quite nice. And we don't have a way of dealing with this. The, the, the traditional Russian attacks came with GRU officers on holiday in Salisbury. <laughs> and oh, that was quite difficult we didn't catch them beforehand but we, we kind of know how to do this and we've done fantastic work and we've got all their passport numbers now it's much harder for them to get visas we're restricting their travel around Europe but if someone in a bar in a random part of London, Tottenham goes to some local mafia guy and says look here's a picture of Mr Fink he runs a podcast we don't like go and you know, smash up his car £2,000 now, £2,000 when you've done it. That's really hard for our services to interdict, to, to, to find out. 
And we don't have an answer to this. And, and the, I mean, it's very good that Kai Kallas has become the new head of uh, European foreign, foreign and security policy, because she's really keen on this, and she wants to sort of throw the book at them to treat these attacks not as hooliganism, arson, criminal damage, but hit them with national security penalties. So you don't go to three years, go to prison for three years, you go to prison for 30. This, is, this counts as treason. We need to join the dots. We need to get our authorities to see that this is not just some isolated event, but a really serious thing. But we're hopeless of this in this country. We have this thing called JSTAT, which is the outward-facing bit of MI5, and it does for hostile state activity what the National Cyber Security Centre does on cyber and other bits doing terrorism. And guess what? Two things JSTAT doesn't do, information and money. And guess what the two big ve vectors of Russian attacks are here? Information and money. Uh, yeah, I, I think our society is polarised anyway. I mean, um, it's one of the uh, weaknesses within democracy. Democracy is the best system we've got. But unfortunately, we have to, in the information age, with the growth of social media, um, we have become more polarised. And the insidious nature of the Russian intelligence services is that they've... Uh, They've, they've sought to exploit those weaknesses and exploit that division within our society and more importantly to amplify it. Um, I do think though that um, there are ways to combat. Um, there are s several. One is legislation. I mean, uh, they took the, um, the TV license uh, thing away from uh, Russia Today. Um, I do think they, they, they should invest in, uh, or they should create um, perhaps new laws to go after people who support rogue regimes, just as, just as there's legislation to stop you from promoting uh, the ideologies of the Islamic <coughs> State. If there are, there's a swathe of online so-called journalists or self-described journalists that go and support North Korea, uh, China, uh, Syria, Russia, and um, these people um, uh, go to these places and they, uh, they get paid from uh, these rogue regimes. And just as in the US that you have to register as a foreign agent, maybe there's some sort of similar legislation that can be brought on in Britain, I don't know. But um, there are more things as well. I think education is important. Um, in, in this information age when uh, social media is so prevalent and, so, and can be frankly quite dangerous, um, just teaching our young people how to engage with information online. Um, and that can be incredibly productive. It's often, when I went to university, I was incredibly bad, I must say. But one thing university did do for me was it taught me to really um, think for myself. I wasn't a kid anymore. I wasn't a child anymore. And uh, that sort of um, empowering feeling of going to university and discovering reading and, just, and reading around a subject uh, that really helped me. And I think that very similar things can be done for uh, children uh, in, the secondary, uh, in secondary school. So, and then obviously it's not just at home, it's a broader well as well. Edward said about... Um, Increasingly using uh, criminals to do their dirty work. Increasingly around the world, they're, doing, uh, they're using mercenaries, not just in Ukraine, but in Africa as well. Again, going after these organizations, declaring them either terrorist links or, um, uh, or describing them as what they are, which is mindless thugs and gangsters who have brutalized and tortured the people of Syria and, and other parts of Africa and the rest of the world. So the robust legislation and education, I think we should start there. This information. But the other one is the National Security Act 2023. And this was pioneered by Tom Tugendhat uh, through, the, through the Commons. And it's, it's largely unknown because it's not really been used. But I'll give you an example. I, people may know I am a victim of Russian disinformation. Uh, the Russian FSB hacked my emails, doctored the contents, and then leaked them to a pro-Russian website called The Grey Zone, which then spread them all around the American media. And the story they constructed about me is that I am an MI5 agent. Now, you may laugh at this, and, and I certainly am not. You know, I, 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 I have never been security checked and cleared. I have never signed an official secrets act. But what does that mean for me? It's not just trying to chill my journalism. It, it means am I got, if I go through a vehicle checkpoint in Nigeria and they get my ID and my passport out, what do they see? They see the grades. I'll say, is an MI5 agent going through your checkpoint? It's just not safe for me to go to some of the places I used to go to. And more than that, of course, perfectly innocent people who only get their news from places like Navarra Media or Declassified, 
which, is, which are, I would say, useful idiot websites. I don't be believe they're agents of influence, but people who only get their news from that, I've seen it happen to me, and I expected it, but it, it happened really quickly and really quite shockingly. Young lads who only read that, who run up to you in your face and say, what the fuck are you doing, you, you fucking MI5 agent? Hold on a minute, I, you know, I'm, just, I'm just here doing my job. And, and you find people are triggered into aggression, um, and worse. So what do we do? The National Security Act 2023 says, if you spread disinformation knowingly on behalf of a foreign power, you are liable to 10 years in jail. And I'm really glad about that act. It's just, I'm not so glad about the fact it's never been actually activated or tried, but what it means is that we have the legislative power behind us to police this info. I'll finish on this. The, I, I would say to all politicians, we need to raise by one level of DEFCON, you know, one level of alert, our understanding of what's going on. With sanctions, it needs to be, we stop talking about sanctions, talk about economic war. Stop talking about information war and start talking about cut, active counter hybrid measures, you know, of the kind we carried out in the Second World, Second World War. You, Labour politician, you, those of you who know, Hugh Dalton, mild-mannered Labour politician, sat down at the beginning of the Second World War and said, we need to set up something like the IRA throughout Europe. We need to burn, we need to do terrorism, we need to do sabotage and, and disinformation. Little old mild-mannered Hugh Dalton set up the SOE. And we're going to need an SOE because they're not going away. The Russians are not going to, to give up. They are determined to destroy our society and our, the, the, the global <coughs> order which guarantees the food that arrives on your table every day. They just can determine. So get real politicians. We're in, we're in a huge conflict. So, that, that was brilliant, Paul. And I just want to underline something here. We used to be really good at this. We invented this. There's a guy called Sefton Delmer who worked on disinformation, tied the Nazis up in knots. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of unilaterally disarmed uh, all the amazing capabilities we had in the Second World War and the Cold War. We kind of got rid of them all in the 90s. There are still some old people around who re remember how to do it. But it's so frustrating to see the Russians taking these techniques and using them against us when we were actually really good at them once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, I'm glad you chose this venue because Mr. Peter Pomerantz, who has written very eloquently about it, is across town. But I'm glad you chose this venue and not that one. Um, I'm going I'm to carry on with that because this is the, one of the major challenges facing democracy, the freedom of speech versus weaponized narratives. Mm. And often the response is, well, let's do fact-checking, let's do this, let's do that. The BBC have a huge team doing fact-checking. Unfortunately, as, as Peter and I are discussing, fact-checking does not really work because propaganda works as a narrative. It creates an alternative reality. It takes over your head. So picking individual facts or non-facts is, is not going to provide an alternative version of reality. We have, there's no reform candidates here, you will have noticed, or, although we were berated for that, but that's, you know, that's our choice. There's a debate, an adult debate, rather than a, a finger-pointing exercise. Um, one of the challenges here is you have someone like Farage and Galloway who have appeared on Times Radio. They have mm. taken the Russians' money over and over, and that, that makes them suspect sources. And you have this narrative that has appeared in this election campaign that the war can be laid at the door of NATO, that NATO is responsible for the war, which I don't think anyone in the room really sort of buys into that. The challenge is that narrative is injected into our political system. You have Simon Jenkins, you have uh, Tony Brenton, you have many others who are down that same rabbit hole. They cannot all be labelled as Russian assets. That's not helpful and it's against our own values to do so. How do we tackle the full narrative of propaganda and, and do it based on our own values? Let's start with Edward. This is a subject that could occupy us for a two-year master's or PhD <laughs> course, so but in a couple of minutes. Um, you're absolutely right, fact-checking doesn't work. I mean, it's important to do it because it's then there on the internet people can look. 
But people make their minds up not on the basis, really, of facts and logic. Maybe people in this room do. Most people make their minds up on the basis of feelings. And that's how you've got to um, counter this. I find the simply, and, and I, I do, I, my a lot of my team are here, and we do a lot of door knocking. And one of the things we've learned from door knocking is when people say stupid things, don't say, you're wrong, you're stupid. Because oddly, that doesn't encourage them to vote. Um, my, my, this is my, my great mentor, Paddy Ashton, um, taught me this. He said, if they say something really stupid, say something quite different, like, what line of work are you in? <laughs> or what a nice, intelligent face your dog's got. Uh, but you've got to hit them sideways. And I think that, that, that one of the most powerful lines we have is really simple. It's this. Ukrainians are people. Ukraine's a place. This isn't, this is the Peter Hitchens sort of, um, you know, what I use against Peter Hitchens when I debate him regularly. He thinks that Ukraine is a square on a chessboard mm -hmm. and that Ukraine is a pawn. Ukrainians are pawns on that chessboard and that there are two players, Russia, the West, and we're moving around. And you can argue to kingdom come with him about what was promised or wasn't promised in 1990 and whether NATO did this and so on. It won't work. By far the most powerful argument is to say, I've got a Ukrainian friend. You should meet them. Guess what? They're real people. They have real hopes, real aspirations, real dreams, real fears. And actually, no, those fears are pretty justified. And changing people's experience of reality is the best way of changing their understanding of it and then making, getting them out of that disinformation bubble. Now, I don't see how this is scalable. I don't know what you do when you have whole populations who just believe nonsense. But I do think that simply telling people they're stupid and wrong is unlikely to work. It works with me, but that's because I'm often wrong. <laughs> <laughs>
And um, that's, it stuck with me, that little story, because that was several years ago, and it's just so frustrating that these narratives uh, pollute the discourse sometimes. Barack Obama once said that we, we have, the trouble with social media is we tend to get trapped in bubbles, and the, the, it's like an echo chamber. This misinformation gets repeated back to ourselves, and that's why it's one of the greatest challenges, and, and, and hopefully things like education is, is the key. I have to be honest though, in addition to the generic problem of, of disinformation and uh, the generic problem of you know, social media is a great vector of uh, hybrid warfare, we in Britain, and, and my side of politics do have a particular problem. I would argue the Tories did as well. The Tories were awash with Russian money, but we were awash with something else, and I'm going to be really honest with you. So, so I'm from a labour movement background. My dad and granddad were miners. Um, many members of my family fought in the Second World War. They thought it was an anti-fascist war. And they came out of the, that anti-fascist war um, thinking the Soviet Union was a great place. Um, they didn't have to join the Communist Party, and none of them ever did. But they were very, very grateful for the sacrifice made by what they thought of as the Russian people. Of course, this was also, at the time, Ukrainian people. And we knew that because in a mining town in, 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 in northern England were many Ukrainians uh, and Poles living, uh, second generation Poles living with us. So we knew about what was wrong with the Soviet Union, but there was still this hang around of it, it, it helped us in the war. Now, the problem is on top of that, you've got a political tradition in the British left that thought the Soviets were right to crack down in Hungary in 56. The Soviets were justified in cracking down in the Prague Spring that they were justified in invading Afghanistan, that the people who were sad when the Berlin Wall fell, and um, they're still around. And unfortunately, three of them ended up in Jeremy Corbyn's office as his advisors. This is the problem. And I can tell you, because I was part of Corbynism, and I was part of someone who tried to make the Labour Party be a left-wing party, that they, it, my mistake was to believe that these beliefs for them were somehow secondary to their central belief that we need you know, good health care and higher wages. And what I found out on contact with them is no, these, this belief is existential to them. And that's why you've had Murray, Andrew Murray, you know, going to, see, to interview Galloway, fawning over Galloway, not mentioning Galloway's uh, homophobia, and still less his, his, his horrific uh, you know, other problems. Um, another one of them, uh, you know, was, there, was, there was one of them who was putting around all the disinformation around that so-called Jack Bayo article, the one that, right at the beginning of the war, this Swiss intelligence officer claimed he'd seen the evidence that it was all a plot by NATO. So we've got a, a problem. We've got a problem inside the Labour movement. And it's, uh, in the party, it's gone. I would say most of the people who believe it have left. The MPs who tried it on have been very t firmly told, you know, not to try this on again. Corbyn is out. Claudia, Claudia Webb is out. The problem is in certain trade unions, where we and my colleagues who are sitting at the back of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign have fought a strenuous effort to keep certain British trade unions supporting Ukraine. I can tell you on their behalf it's been difficult, because this narrative is not, it's not just it's spread by you know, Galloway and Russia today, it's spread among people because they want to believe it. And so we have a job of work to do. I, I'm certain the Labour government will be immune to it. But here's my, I'll tell you what my fear is. We get to a point, we get to a point where something happens. Putin tries another round of nuclear diplomacy. There's a new nuclear threat. Um, certain people in the West, Schultz maybe, they're, they're worried about it, they waver. I can guarantee you that at this moment, at this point, certain people in the British trade union movement will stand up and say, make peace now. We don't want to be nuked. Uh, it's all very well to support Ukraine, but nuclear war is a, a step too far. CND will stand up and say it, Stop the War will stand up and say it, Corbyn will stand up and say it. We need to be absolutely clear what that is. It's an attempt to reflexively control this country yes. through civil society. And fine, I don't want the state to help me. I don't need the state to censor them. I don't want any, any, anything bad to happen to them. All that I want to do is for us to get together and fight back. One more before, and then we'll go to the Q&A. I think we're about at that stage here. And 
speaking to a couple of people the, the, this afternoon, um, the point was forcefully made that it's all very well thinking about Ukraine's future and rebuilding, and that's where a lot of energy and effort is going into. Ukraine has to win before that happens. But let's assume Ukrainian victory is going to happen. I think everyone here uh, fervently hopes and believes that will be the case. What can Britain do in a post-conflict uh, Ukraine, both to help it retain its resilience, build up its security, but also reconstruct its institutions and physically you know, clean the environment, all these other things. What role can Britain play in that? Uh, let's start with Edward again. Um, I gratefully accept the premise of your question. Um, I think that the reconstructing Ukraine will be the most enormously difficult task. At the beginning of the war, when I thought the war might be over quite quickly, and I thought that this would have an immensely positive effect, that this had kind of galvanised Ukrainians into thinking differently about their relationship with the state, it had had a huge boost to civil society, and that, the, um, that this would mean that Ukraine would be, you know, victorious Ukraine would be fizzing, and obviously any wonder is one too many, but we would be fizzing with <coughs> energy and solidarity. I now think that post-war Ukraine, even if we have victory, it's going to be traumatised. Mm -hmm. There's going to be people who left, people who stayed, people who get compensation, people who didn't, people who lost loved ones, people who didn't. Um, there's going to be squabbles over the, 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 the fruits of, of victory. And so I'm quite, I'm quite nervous about that, and I, I sincerely hope I'm wrong, but I think that trauma tends to come back and bite you. And we see from you know, Northern Ireland, which I used to report on, 20-something years after the Good Friday Agreement, those wounds aren't healed. And that was tiny in comparison to the trauma that Ukraine's been through. So I worry about that. But I think the most important thing for Britain to do is to stop any attempt to welcome naively what happens next in Russia. My biggest worry, apart from you know, Russia winning or anything like that, is that we get some kind of putsch or <coughs> something in Moscow and Putin is sent off to be the head of the Russian Ice Hockey Federation and we get <coughs> some of these sort of so-called technical who say, yeah, okay, fine, it was a terrible mistake, you blame it on Putin, we're the new guys, you don't want loose nukes, you don't want Russia to break up, so you've got to help us. Pretty much the argument that was made in 1991. And they will say, oh, <clears throat> so let's back off on reparations, that's not going to happen. Yes, we've given back most of the territory we conquered, we're going to have some kind of fix on Crimea and we'll maybe keep a bit of the Donbass and Yes, Ukraine can maybe join NATO within some sort of parameters, but in the end, we're still the big country, you've got to deal with us. And I really worry that so many Western countries are going to go, phew, Putin's yep. gone. Just the way we said, phew, Yeltsin's gone. Actually, the way we said, phew, Gorbachev's gone, and before that it was phew, Androkhov's gone, and before that it was phew. And remember, the, the, the Times in 1953, when Stalin died, <laughs> said, there's a real danger now, the hardliners might take over. <laughs> so we, we are very good at getting Russia wrong and I worry that we will get post-Putin Russia wrong and I would be delighted if when everyone else is hurtling to believe their own wishful thinking if the British government um, doubtless was well advised by Paul um, can say hang on, hang on a moment <laughs> Well, I, I truly believe in the ultimate victory of the Ukrainian people against the Russian aggressor. I, I genuinely believe uh, that's more than possible, not just the return of Crimea, but actually all, yeah, all former territories back to the 1991 borders. Um, uh, and I think that uh, with the right amount of support, that's achievable. Um, in terms of after the war is over, I would hope that um, the United Kingdom will, if we are going to make it about the UK and what, what UK can do, perhaps take a lead as we have on Storm Shadow and tanks and all the rest of it in um, investing in Ukraine. Ukraine is an intensely wealthy country. It, part of the um, 
what's the word, the sort of imperialism of Russia since the fall of the uh, Soviet Union has been to promote corruption, to erode trust within Ukrainian society, to divide Ukraine. And once, I, I get the feeling that Ukraine has finally thrown that off, those shackles that, that have held it back for so many years until this recent invasion uh, are gone. And I think Ukraine has been hurt so badly by this war that young people just won't have it anymore. Mm. Um, they, they won't put up with any form of corruption or bad governance. And they, they want a new future for Ukraine. They, they have to, it has to be worth it. Everything that we've had to endure over the last two years has to be worth it. And um, if Britain were to, one thing that the Conservative government has done is this as ring fence um, the overseas aid budget uh, to keep it at 1%. Uh, hopefully, the Labour, future Labour government will build on that. And if we can take um, a huge effort and lead the world effort into rebuilding Ukraine, and more importantly, investing in Ukraine, uh, it'll be good for Europe, it'll be good for us, it'll be good for Ukraine. And, and I think that will be part of the healing effort that we all want to see for Ukraine. Yeah. So, I, I'm a student of, you know, sadly, I spent a, long t a lot of time, um, the past few years, researching and writing a book about fascism, historical fascism. And one of the things we underestimated about the causes of fascism, we, we tend to think it's, it was caused by the Great Depression. Um, I'm not the only person who studied it, who now thinks the, the real thing, thing about fascism, it was caused by, if you're looking for a cause, um, millions of men running around traumatized. That's, that's what caused fascism. It, it, the Italians after World War I and the Germans uh, traumatised by both, not just World War I, but, but their participation in the, in the Russian Civil War, what we call the Russian Civil War. I call it World War I and a half. It's three and a half years of absolute trauma and slaughter. And why it's relevant is because I think we, we, when we talk about the potential trauma of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, it's not just something we're going to sort out by psychotherapy. It's got, got something that's got to be sorted out by a, a co coordinated effort by the West to do something that the British government calls stabilisation. Now we've got very good methodologies for stabilisation. It's something that as a big country we have done to other countries. But I think to do it with Ukraine, uh, there are techniques and methods which involve literally finding all the sources within civil society that promote, promote cohesion and resilience and building on. It's something that the Brits are keen to do in Gaza right now, and the, and the Americans and the Israelis are not interested in. Um, but I would say, in addition, I agree. I hear what you say about uh, about the, the, the attitude to post-war Russia. I think one thing I would say is we need to make make it absolutely clear that the West is not interested in the geographical breakup of Russia, because there are people around the Ukrainian movement who who sometimes say, well. You know, we quite like that to be, to, to be like, well, let's dismember it. Like, I, I'm not in favour of that. But what I'd say is look at the border. Look at the border post-victory. Post I, like you, believe that the victory happens when Russia and the Russian people, not just Putin, lose the will and lose the means to fight. That's Karl von Clausewitz's famous definition of victory. And I believe that's possible. Once they lose the will and the means to fight, we're going to left with a shattered Ukraine and a big, long border. Okay. In a way, Putin, in his stupid essay, uh, The Historical Unity of the Ukrainians and Russians, in a way, he's got one point. That is, you cannot have a democratic Ukraine full of resilient, educated, european oriented people living their lives to the full as modern people. And a Russia like Russia, you just can't with a border that long and so porous. So what will happen? There'll be a Russian revolution. And that's where the Western elite, uh, I'm not sure they've got their stomach for it. Um, my political tradition kind of does. You know, I, 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 I think Russia, Russia's future is, cannot be to be a dictatorship that sits at the edge of Europe, sitting alongside and sabotaging a democratic and vibrant and Western oriented Ukraine. It just won't work. What will happen eventually is that, is that one way or the other, the, it's, so I'm not interested in the dismemberment of Russia. I do think there's going to have to be the overthrow of the whole Siloviki elite. They, they can't go <coughs> on. And look, you know, it's, I don't want my, I'm not interested in committing the British state to that, but I spent my life in the Labour movement, you know, um, 
building solidarity with people in Nicaragua, in Bolivia, in you know, and, and South Africa under apartheid. We had no problem in saying, let's find the people who are in favor of a democratic future for these countries, so let's do the same. Let's find the people who are in favor of it. It might, it might be hard. People in favor of a democratic future for Russia, and let's help them. We'll now we go to the Q&A section.